Hello, my name is Dr. Eva Zingone, and today we're going to be talking about chiropractic care for pregnancy. I am a certified perinatal chiropractor. I've been working with pregnant moms for the last decade, and this past year was very special because I got to go through all of it myself. I had my first baby in July. My son Rocco is now six months old, and because I'm also married to a chiropractor, I got to see what it felt like to get adjusted throughout my pregnancy and noticed all of the amazing benefits it had for my comfort level, for my level of functioning overall throughout my pregnancy, and especially in getting to have the birth that I had always hoped for. My husband and I practice together in San Diego, and our office specializes in pediatric care as well as perinatal care. You can see in this picture on the left, I'm working with a pregnant mama. I also happen to be pregnant in that picture. And this is one of the most awesome things about being a perinatal chiropractor and a pediatric chiropractor is that I get to work with moms and their babies while their babies are inside of their belly. And then I get to work with their babies when they are welcomed earthside and I get to see them grow up and be their chiropractor as well. My husband and I are both certified breastfeeding specialists and I am also Dona trained as a doula. Today we're going to talk about chiropractic in general. What is it? A lot of people think about back pain and car accidents when they think about chiropractors. And then when you come into an office like ours and you see newborn babies getting adjusted and toddlers running around everywhere, you wonder why are those kids getting adjusted if they don't have any pain? when really there's so much more to chiropractic than meets the eye. So I'm going to share some of that with you. We're gonna talk about pregnancy and why chiropractic is so important during pregnancy. I'm gonna show you what you should look for in a practitioner because getting adjusted pregnant is not like getting adjusted when you're not pregnant. We're gonna talk about what you can expect at your visits as well. And then to end, we're gonna do some demos and I'm gonna show you how you can best support your nervous system, create balance in your body, prepare for birth at home, starting right now. So first and foremost, we just have to take a minute to acknowledge how freaking incredible our bodies are. We can take a single cell, a single fertilized egg, and turn it into trillions of cells, growing a human baby in less than a year. And every single detail is accounted for, from the fingernail to every single strand of eyebrow hair. And there's no instruction manual for this. Our body just knows what to do. The system that regulates this whole process is our nervous system. Our nervous system is the main communication network in our body. It's the way our brain talks to our body and our body talks to our brain. It's comprised of the brain, the brain stem, and all the nerves that travel out to every part of your body. And this is a two-way street. So we've got information going from the brain to the body, but also the body to the brain, signaling our brain in terms of the environment and how to respond to the environment. So you can think of the role of your nervous system as like if you were driving next to someone in traffic and you saw that they were texting and they started to swerve into your lane, you would feel instantaneously your heart rate start to speed up, you might start to get really hot, your breathing rate would change, you feel the stress response coming on. And then even if that threat subsides, the person drifts back into their own lane, thank goodness, you might still be left with this feeling of like, oh, fluttery freakouts, and you've got to do some deep breathing to kind of bring yourself back to balance. That's your nervous system. Perceiving the environment, formulating a response, it's designed to keep you safe. Now, during pregnancy, we are two nervous systems in one, and the way that we respond to our world is starting to shape the way that baby will perceive their world. Is the world a safe and calm place? Is it a scary place? Are we always on edge? Am I being dumped all of these stress hormones that I'm always responding to? Most of us are in a chronic state of, we call it fight or flight. We're always kind of anticipating that next stressful event because we may not always have physical threats like bears chasing after us these days, but we do have chronic everyday stressors at work. We have tension in our relationships. We may have other children. The list goes on and on. So chiropractic is really designed to balance your nervous system so that you can better adapt to stress. So your brain and body brain and body can communicate more clearly, which you can imagine why that's important during pregnancy when you are coordinating the growth of another human. Now, it's not hard to think of stressors that are prevalent during pregnancy. Physically, we have our whole center of gravity shifting the bigger our belly gets. We have the hormone relaxin that softens all of our joints and makes things loosey-goosey so that everything can expand and make way for baby. But along with that, we lose some stability. So our muscles are working harder. We also have our abdomen that is stretching to accommodate space for baby. Emotionally, this can be really challenging to see our bodies change. 
emotionally, we've got our hormones that make a, make us hypersensitive towards everything. I think that one of the reasons why perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are so prevalent is because we don't really acknowledge the emotional aspect enough. This is a major life change. And then chemically, the foods that we eat, the toxins we're exposed to, I think most of us know about the toxins at this point. I think if anything, we know too much about toxins and I think it becomes really stressful during pregnancy to avoid every single little thing. When you think that everything putting that you're putting into your body is going to impact your baby, it can kind of drive you crazy. So that can create emotional stress that can create physical tension in the body. And all of these types of stress play off of one another in that way. So we like to say that your body is a storybook of everything that's ever happened to you. We have all of these different stressors that accrue throughout the course of a lifetime. And ideally, stress is coming in, we're able to process it and then discharge it. So it's not just building up. If we're not able to discharge or to integrate or have adequate recovery, our stress just sort of builds up and up and up and it just accumulates. So we all have different chapters of our story going into pregnancy. Some of us might be in a really balanced place when we get pregnant and we're really good in, in a good mental space. We've been eating a really great diet for years and we've got no pains. But most of us, there are some aches and pains. There are some imbalances. There's a fall that you had when you were a child or a sport you played in high school, tennis on one side, or you know, there's one way that you sit at work or you've been sitting at the computer for decades. We enter into this stressful period already having built up a good amount of stress. So we've got like our backlog of experiences that needed to be integrated. And then when the demands of pregnancy happen, our body kind of shuts down. It's kind of like pregnancy shines a spotlight on all of the unresolved issues that you have in your body. And maybe a symptom that was silent before, like some hip pain that you used to have back in high school that reemerges during your pregnancy because of that increased demand and that load in your body just doesn't have as much bandwidth to process everything. So because we each have our own unique story, there is no one size fits all approach when it comes to caring for a pregnant mom. And in our office, we make a care plan for each individual mom because her needs are different and her goals are different for her birth, for her recovery, and her ongoing levels of stress are different. So we have a way of measuring how a mom is responding to stress in our office through these insight scans that we do. And these scans measure various layers of the nervous system, and they essentially show us how efficiently you are processing stress. And it can point to specific areas where you're maybe locked up or not processing stress as efficiently. Now, these scans involve no radiation, so they're totally safe for kids. We do them on newborn babies. And there's something that can be done again and again throughout the course of someone's care. So we can continuously measure how their nervous system is changing as they are getting adjusted week to week. Alrighty. So a balanced nervous system is our number one goal as chiropractors for any human being. But there is another priority when it comes to pregnancy, and that is the balance of your pelvis, like the physical balance of your structure. So here is a model of the human pelvis. If we were to look at it from the back, we see we have our two hip bones here, and then we've got our sacrum, like our tailbone, in the middle. Now, you can think of the pelvis as a basket on a hot air balloon. This is the basket. The balloon is your uterus. And the uterus is baby's home for nine months. It is connected to the pelvis, the basket, by these strings, right? The basket strings are like our ligaments. We've got ligaments in front, the round ligaments, and we've got two ligaments in back that are the broad ligaments that are suspending the uterus to the pelvis. So what this means is the alignment of your pelvis impacts the shape of your uterus. So let's pretend that the sacrum here is twisted somewhat. Let's say that this person had a, you know, they used to play a sport or they've been sitting with their legs crossed or there's a number of reasons why we might have a slight misalignment in the pelvis. If this were to twist and it's attached to one of those ligaments holding the uterus in place, it can twist and torque the uterus in the same way that if you were to yank on one of those basket strings on the hot air balloon, the entire balloon would tilt over. Now, when we have some twisting or torsion in the uterus, it impacts the amount of available space for baby. Now, ideally, baby is going to be face down with their the back of their head facing outward, sort of facing your belly by the time that you're ready to give birth. If the uterus is twisted or tweaked in some way, it is going to make it harder for baby to find that nice head down position. And baby's always gonna find the best position available to them based on how much space they have. So as chiropractors, 
the Webster technique is something we use. It's an analysis and a specific technique that we use to balance the pelvis so that we're able to even out the amount of forces and tension on the uterus so that we're optimizing the likelihood that baby can get in the best position for birth. So this impacts mom's comfort during pregnancy, but it also really impacts birth outcomes. Now, adjustments for pregnant moms are not the same as adjustments for people that are not pregnant. You're not just like a normal person with a belly. If you are seeing your chiropractor and they are not adjusting you differently when you become pregnant, they're not changing their technique or their approach at all, it's kind of a red flag because there are a lot of considerations based on the pregnant body. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't still have a lot of options. Pregnant women can be adjusted in all different positions. You see here on the far left, we've got a mom laying down. We have special pillows in our office that have a cutout in the middle so her belly can rest and be supported while she gets adjusted. Usually this is like amazing because it's the only time that a mom's been able to lay face down during her whole pregnancy and you just kind of want to lay there forever. We can do adjustments face up. We can do adjustments seated using our hands, using special tools. Chiropractic doesn't have to involve twisting or popping or cracking if that's something that freaks you out or if that's something that your body just doesn't respond well to. It's good to find an office that offers a lot of different techniques so you can find something that you're comfortable with and that works for you. To find a prenatal chiropractor who is certified in the Webster technique, this is very important. You're going to want to use the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association directory, the ICPA. Um, the website is listed here. This is going to, you can search by your zip code or your um, the name of your city and find someone near you who does this type of work. Alrighty, so now it's your turn. I'm gonna show you what you can do at home to improve the health of your nervous system. Maybe you live miles away from a good prenatal chiropractor. Maybe you're already seeing a chiropractor and you just wanna do some extra credit and get even better value out of your adjustments. I'm gonna give you guys strategies in each of those categories of stressors. We're gonna go through some physical strategies, chemical and that mental emotional element to make sure that you have everything you need to have a very balanced, pregnancy and birth. Here we go. Let's start with the basics. There's nothing more basic than breath. We breathe all day long, whether or not we're consciously aware of it. But the cool thing about our breath is if we do decide to consciously tune into our breath, we can control our state. We can actually influence our nervous system directly through our breathing. So I'm going to show you two different methods of breathing today. One that is going to help to regulate and calm your nervous system and one that is going to help you connect with the muscles that are going to be important during labor and birth in helping you deal with discomfort and pain. So the first method is called box breathing. Box breathing is where you're matching the length of your inhales to the length of your exhales. And this has an overall calming effect on your nervous system. Something about breathing and counting in general just seems to be really relaxing. The box breathing, I like to sprinkle in throughout my day. I find that it's really useful when I'm in a transition from one activity to the next. I find that if I just show up to anywhere I'm going a couple minutes early, I factor in time to basically sit in my car and do 30 seconds worth of box breathing. I did that all throughout my pregnancy and it just helped ground me. So to set up for your box breathing, there's really no setup. You can sit, you can lay, you can be in any position that works for you. We're just gonna simply count to five in our head as we inhale. Then we're gonna hold our breath and count to five. Then we're gonna count to five in our head as we exhale. So I'm gonna breathe in, in my head I'm counting to five. Now I'm gonna hold my breath in for five seconds. Then I'm gonna exhale, counting to five. Beautiful. So in my mind, if I do five, five, five for five, five for inhale, five holding it in, five for exhale, I do this five times, that to me feels like a nice complete set. Breath work ought to feel good. So if the, if the duration doesn't work for you, if you're feeling lightheaded, if anything feels off, feel free to modify because the whole point of the breath is to bring more ease into your body and not create more tension or distress. So the second breathing exercise I'm gonna show you, we're gonna call it pelvic floor breathing, but really it's just 
tuning into the natural rhythms of your pelvic floor muscles, the way that they coordinate with your breath on their own. This breath can be so important during birth because we wanna be able to relax our pelvic floor muscles in order to make space for baby to come out easily. When we are really tight in the pelvic floor, it can stall things up, it can create tension in the body. So we wanna learn how to use our breath to directly influence the state of relaxation or tension in our pelvic floor. So when I breathe in, I want to picture that I have an inner tube, like a pool tube around my rib cage. And I want to think about breathing in through the front, through the back, through the sides. I want to fill up all sides of the inner tube equally with air. I'm also picturing that those pelvic floor muscles are dropping and relaxing and going nice and supple. When you exhale, you want to tighten the pelvic floor. You want to think about knitting in your abdomen, almost like you were wearing a corset and you want to clench your pelvic floor as if you were holding in a pee. So what this looks like as I'm breathing in, I'm expanding, I'm allowing my pelvic floor to drop, and then as I exhale, my pelvic floor lifts and everything comes in. So breathing in, dropping and opening, breathing out, lifting. Now, unlike the box breathing that I like to do throughout my day, the pelvic floor breathing, I always like to do at night. So I would lay down, I would connect with my baby, and I would work on that pelvic floor breathing as part of my sort of nightly, get my head in the game for birth prep ritual. You can do it again, whenever works best for you. All right, now let's talk about how to offset all of that physical stress from your growing belly. It really comes down to posture and movement. So I'm gonna show you good standing posture, good seated posture, how to maintain good alignment in general as you're going throughout your day. And then I'm gonna show you some very simple movements you can do to wind down and relieve stress before going to bed. So first, first things first is standing posture. I'm gonna show you this standing perfectly still, but these are just things to consider even when you're walking, even when you're moving around, doesn't mean you have to stand like a statue all day with perfect posture. I'm just gonna show you the ideal. So starting from the bottom and working our, our way up, we wanna keep our feet right underneath our knees. We wanna keep the knees nice and loose. We wanna avoid locking out our knees. That's a lot of strain on the joint. When we get to the hips, this is when we see a lot of pregnant mamas kind of doing that waddle. The weight of the belly makes us wanna jut the hips forward to alleviate some of that, but that's not great for our low back or for our hips. So we wanna keep the pelvis nice and neutral. That is gonna require us to engage our core a little bit, and that's okay, that's a good thing. So pelvis is nice and neutral. Then we wanna think about the shoulders. The tendency here is to round and slump forward because of the weight of the belly. So we wanna really counteract that, engaging our back so that we're keeping our shoulders up and back and tough without flaring the rib cage way out. Lastly is the head and neck. Most of us, especially if we're working at a computer, we start to drift forward and the neck goes way out and that puts a lot of strain on the upper back and shoulders. So we wanna keep the chin tucked back so that we have the ear and the shoulder in good alignment like so. So I can take these key principles, I can start to move my body and not be a robot person, but I can keep those things in mind so that I'm stacking my body in a good way and we're not putting a lot, a lot of strain or pressure on any one area. Most of us are gonna spend the majority of our pregnancy sitting down. As much as we love to be walking and active and stretching, we may work for a living, sitting down at home when we're relaxing, you can't avoid it. So what we wanna think about with sitting is the way that you are positioned, you wanna avoid being rocked back or slouching like this. You wanna think about what that's doing to your pelvis, it's gonna be collapsing things down, it's not gonna feel good. What you wanna think about is being rocked forward. You wanna be sitting right on these pointy parts of your hip bones and you wanna allow space for baby to almost feel like they're like in a little hammock. So I like to invest in a birth ball. These are relatively inexpensive. You can find them online on Amazon. You wanna make sure you have it the right size. And I like these for work and for home. I see a lot of moms sitting on a ball that's way too small and it's shrinking down their hip flexors and it's compressing their pelvis. You wanna make sure the ball is big enough so that it brings your hips either level with your knees or slightly higher than your knees. So once you've got the right size ball, there are a couple different ways that you can sit on the ball to encourage good motion in your hips. So first is just sitting on the ball, making sure I'm rocked forward enough so that I am having that good tilt of the pelvis, space for belly. I can bring my feet wide if I want more stability and I can just move from side to side. Hips go from side to side and because I'm on the ball, they're gonna kind of move in sort of a U shape and that's really wonderful motion for the hips. 
Now, because our pelvis is so dynamic and it's used to rocking in many different planes of motion, another great option is to work in a figure eight. So you're gonna do little loops, almost like you're making an infinity sign with your hips to the left, to the right, working in a figure eight motion. This is really excellent for your pelvis. And then the third option is to tilt your hips forward and back. So I'm gonna show you here from the side. You're gonna think about tucking your pelvis under you and then bringing it back to neutral. Tucking the pelvis under, neutral. So we're kind of going from that position that we don't want to sit in, right? To neutral. This is just getting some good motion in there. And of course, if you're using the ball at work, you can simply sit on the ball as an alternative to a chair. Um, the ball's great to have around for after baby arrives. My baby loved to be bounced on the ball, breastfed on the ball. It was the only way he fell asleep. So good investment to start with. So with regards to sleeping position, we're often told that during pregnancy, we have to sleep on the left side. Now sleeping on your left side, all that pressure on your left hip all night can be so uncomfortable, especially if you're doing it for nine months straight. So really the reasoning behind that, if you think about it, the heavier your belly gets, the more pressure it's gonna place on your blood vessels. That's the reason why laying on your back face up at the end of your third trimester probably isn't going to be comfortable. So theoretically, if we're laying on our left side, we are alleviating pressure on our blood vessels. But if baby's healthy and you're healthy, Really, you can get away with some other sleeping positions and save your body. So I'm gonna show you those positions now. It's gonna be left side sleeping, right side sleeping, and sleeping at an incline. So if I were to sleep on my left side, really on either side, I wanna think about keeping that nice neutral pelvis. I don't wanna be collapsing, I don't wanna be twisting. I wanna use pillows to keep me in alignment. So you wanna first think about your head pillow being just the right height to keep your head neutral and to account for the space between your shoulder and neck. You don't want your head to be collapsing down and you don't want too many pillows so you're tilted up. Then you're gonna place a pillow in between your knees so we're keeping that pelvis nice and neutral. And if you want, you can put a third pillow underneath your elbow like so. And if you want, you can shift your, your belly a little bit forward and kind of play around with the position of this pillow so that it's cushioning your belly. This should be nice and supported. So you can do this position on your left side when you wake up, flip over to your right, and I just would flip flop all throughout my pregnancy. Now, if you are early on in the first or second trimester and it's comfortable for you to lay on your back, or if you're having a lot of reflux or digestive issues and it's hard for you to lay flat, you can get one of these wedge pillows and they fold up into sort of a square and then they create a little incline. So what you can do is make sort of a little ramp, gently lift yourself up, and you could sleep at a slight incline. I find it nice to have a little pillow underneath the knees as well if you're sleeping face up. Now, when you're getting up out of bed, from whatever position that you're in, you do wanna start on your side, keeping your knees together. You are going to use your arms to lift yourself up. So you're not just hoisting up and straining your ab muscles. You are coming up in a nice, neutral, easy position. So what about when you're chilling at home on the couch watching TV? We wanna think about the same rules in terms of the pelvis. What we wanna avoid is just slouching and letting it all hang loose because we're tilting the pelvis back, right? And it's gonna be easier for baby to line up their spine with our spine. And that is what we don't want. What we want is to create space for the belly and to make sure that we're sitting up on these bones, of uh, the sit bones. So if you are wanting to sit on the couch, what you're gonna to wanna to do is just scooch all the way to the edge so you're really sitting on the bottom of those sit bones and so that you've got some space for the belly to hang forward and the pelvis gets to be rocked forward. If you want to relax a little more, I like to have either a yoga bolster like this or just some throw pillows handy. You can simply place your bolster or your pillows on the ground. You can sit down with your back supported by the couch and then sit crisscross applesauce. Again, rocking forward so that you're creating that space for your belly to hang in front of you. And if you want, you can alternate between resting your back on the couch. Now, third option, if you really wanna get into ultimate chill mode, is sidelining. And this is gonna be the same rules as for sideline sleep. You're gonna to wanna to have a pillow underneath your head. You're gonna to wanna to use the bolster. And when I'm on the couch, I like to just have my bottom leg kind of neutral. I put the bolster there, and I'm sort of tilted forward. So I'm just allowing that top leg to collapse over. Then I can make sure my neck is in a nice neutral position. 
I can have my little pillow I can hug. So there's some support for my arm. <sighs> and this is so super supported and so comfortable and you could just fall asleep like this really if you wanted to. When we're getting up, the same rules apply. We wanna make sure that we are keeping the pelvis neutral, keeping the knees together. We are gently using our torso to support us, lifting our body weight, scooching, and getting up. What we do not wanna see, and I'm gonna show you only because I have my fake belly in, is hoisting up ugh, like this. Ooh, that's gonna feel so bad on your core. And then separating the knees in order to swing the legs around, that can upset the pubic bone and create a lot of pubic It is so important that you move your body in some way each day during pregnancy. Now, I think walking is a really great activity. If you can get outside in the sunshine, get some fresh air, that's obviously wonderful. But even if you're only up to walking around the house a little bit, do some laps maybe from the kitchen back to the couch, that counts. And it's important to do just something. So I'm gonna show you three stretches that you can do even on a day that you feel like crap and you don't wanna do anything. These are things that take very little time that are very easy, that are still gonna give your body mobility in the areas where you need it the most and where your baby needs it the most. So the first stretch is going to be a lunge. Now for a lunge, you're gonna bring one foot in front of the other. If you need more stability, you can bring your legs out wider, but otherwise you're gonna think about your feet being on sort of train tracks and with a lunge, what we're doing is we're lengthening out the front of the hip. And this area gets really tight when we're sitting a lot, which most of us are, of course. And when we do a lunge, many people think they've just got to go really deep in a lunge to stretch this out. But that is not the case. And we don't want to overstretch during pregnancy because we've got that relaxing hormone that makes everything really loosey-goosey. So we want to keep it sort of tight and condensed. What we want to do is get into our lunge position, and then all we're going to think about is tilting our hips slightly under, almost like we're tucking our butt underneath us and squeezing the butt cheek on the leg that's back. So I'm just gonna look straight forward, squeeze the butt cheek, tilt, and just by making those little tweaks, I should feel opening in this front of the hip flexor. I don't have to go crazy far. So I'm just gonna breathe. If I want a little more intensity, I could bring the arms up above me, take two or three breaths, and then I'm gonna switch sides. The second exercise is gonna be on hands and knees. Now in general, getting on and off the floor, I think is really crucial functionally for us to be able to do as moms, to play with our kids, um, and also just preparation for birth, being comfortable in different positions. So the second exercise I'm gonna show you is sort of a transition from standing to getting onto all fours, which we're gonna do for our third exercise. And that is a squat, a deep squat. So I'm gonna bring my feet at a slight angle, bring them nice and wide, and I'm just going to gently lower my body down until I'm in a nice deep squat. Now I've got a lot of mobility here, as you can see. If you don't have quite this amount of mobility, you can put like a little yoga block underneath here and you can have it as tall as it needs to be to support your butt essentially. But what you wanna do is get into a position where you feel nice and relaxed so that you can breathe, thinking about breathing into that pelvic floor. And this is really great for birth prep because it does practice relaxing the pelvic floor, also opening the hips at the same time. So I'm gonna take two or three breaths in a nice deep squat. Then I'm gonna get right on the hands and knees for my last exercise, which is a modification of like a cat-cow position in yoga. So what we're gonna do is bring our hands right underneath our shoulders and our knees right underneath our hips. And in a traditional cat-cow, you would first bend, like you'd sort of let the belly drop and then you would arch the back like this. Now when we're pregnant, we already have so much weight pulling down on our abdomen. We don't wanna further accentuate that and put a big strain on the low back by doing this. That's probably not gonna feel good. So what we're gonna do is modify it. We're gonna come into a nice neutral position, more of like a tabletop, and we're just gonna do the, the cat portion. So this is making our body into a little rainbow, and then going back to neutral. So as I do this motion, you can see that I'm getting some good tilting through my hips. I'm decompressing, I'm allowing for circulation, good mobility, and it just feels nice and easy on my joints, no strain anywhere. You can do maybe two, three, 10, depending on how much time and energy you have. And that's it. When it comes to reducing chemical stress, we know that everything we eat, everything we're exposed to in our environment in terms of toxins and chemicals can impact the health of our baby and our own health. 
but it can be overwhelming to try and avoid every single toxin. So a good rule of thumb is to start with the things that you put in your body, working on making that really clean. Then if you've got extra money, energy, resources, and bandwidth and desire, you can start to focus on the things you put on your body. So things like personal care products, soaps, then last, you can move your way out to things that are around your body. So things like household cleaning products and, and organic mattresses and bed sheets and whatnot. It's just a way of prioritizing so that everything's not the priority and it just feels almost insurmountable, in which case you might think, what's the point? Why even try? So priority number one is focus on what goes in your body. And those are the things that we eat and the things that we drink for the most part. I always like to focus on adding healthy things in rather than thinking of all the things I'm not allowed to have. So a really simple way to make sure that what you're eating is simple, nutritious, clean, and free of toxic chemicals is by learning how to read labels. So when you are at the grocery store and you're looking at snacks or food items, you wanna make sure that every ingredient is something that you can pronounce. You wanna focus on whole food ingredients. Anything that has a chemical name, something you've never heard of, something you can't pronounce, probably your body doesn't really know how to process that or break that down all that efficiently either. Another great way to reduce your toxic load is to choose organic foods. Now it can be really expensive to buy everything organic. A great way to prioritize is to look at the dirty dozen list put out by the environmental working group. So you can just Google dirty dozen. They have a list of a dozen fruits and vegetables that are sprayed with a lot of chemicals, pesticides, they tend to be more toxic. And then they also put out a list of 15 items that are called the clean 15, items that are not sprayed with as many pesticides, they don't tend to have as much chemical residue, they're a little bit safer to buy conventional. So something like a banana, for example, if we peel off the skin or like an avocado, maybe that's not as important to buy organic as something like a strawberry where we are directly interacting with the surface of the fruit and the surface is maybe very porous and for whatever reason it's exposed to more toxins in its growing process. A third strategy to offset all that chemical stress is to make sure you're hydrating at least half your body weight in ounces and remember that hydration comes in forms other than just water. You can get hydration from things like fruits and vegetables with a high water content. Soups and broths are a really great way to get electrolytes and minerals as well as hydration in your body. Your body has natural detoxification pathways and as long as we're putting in the right foods and we are hydrating properly, our body knows how to eliminate toxins just on its own without any fancy schmancy stuff. Cheers. Thank you guys so much for your time and for your attention. I know that was a lot of information. So thanks for having an open mind to learn about something new. Part two of this video series, we're gonna talk about chiropractic care before and after pregnancy. So benefits for fertility and for postpartum healing. In the meantime, if you'd like to keep in touch, you can find me on Instagram at Pregnancy Tribe. You can email me, mypregnancytribe at gmail.com or visit our website for our chiropractic office, which is getclearchiropractic.com. We will be doing a Q&A as part four of this video series. So if any questions do come to mind, jot them down and you're gonna be able to ask me and I will answer any question you have about chiropractic, pregnancy, kids, babies, etc. See you next time.